Hello there everyone. So today I'm gonna be discussing to you unit one of your course under um, child and adolescent learning principles. And as you can see on screen now, we will be dealing with learner-centered instruction and the principles that go along with it. All right, so I'd like to start off with this from Alfie Khan. It says there that what matters is not what we teach. The pronoun we there refers to teachers, all right? It's what they learn, okay? And of course, the they there refers to you learners. And the probability of real learning is far higher when the learners have a lot to say about the content and the process. It's simple. As teachers, we think, especially if we were during uh, the traditional setup, if we were then the teachers of those times, then we think that uh, we are the sages on the stage. And so whatever we tell, whatever we teach the learners, they're all that matters. And uh, it would even sound that uh, learning should come, all right, largely from us or from great books along with our teaching. But, uh, you know, as the paradigm shifts, all right, or as many platforms in education have pushed transformations, then uh, you'll get to realize that during our time now, especially your time, the face of teaching is no longer the usual. We no longer rely so much or just solely on what the teachers can offer us. You know, because we too are doing the learning. And this is what Alf Alfie Khan is actually telling. You know, the gauge or the measure of how far the learners have actually learned is when they have something to say about what the content is. Let's say, for example, the teacher gives you something to read and then the teacher will allow you to synthesize, to analyze a point in there or uh, a theme maybe or to discover something out of the reading material. Then that is actually you telling something about the content. Or perhaps you guys are asked uh, to participate or to watch over uh, a show wherein participants are dancing or people are actually executing exercises and then the teacher at the end of the show would ask you your observations would uh, let you describe things that you have witnessed and uh, this accordingly like Alphon emphasized here in this line is actually where you can see how far or high, how high the real learning process is, okay? So it's, it's not too much about what the teachers have to say, but it's more of what do you have to say after you have learned or watched or maybe involved yourselves on something in the learning process, all right? So think about that. And that leads us, of course, to what Unit 1 is all about. Look at this. There are uh, two diagrams that would show you how different it is when the teacher solely mans the classroom or the learning process or the teaching learning process. And on the other side would be when the learner is actually being involved. Observe the arrows from the first point, which is on the left. As you can see on screen, knowledge and experience are actually just coming uh, or are just being delivered by the teacher down to the learners. So learners in this teacher-centered learning picture, as you can see, is actually uh, or are actually, all right, they are actually just considered passive. They just have to receive, they have to be receptive of what the teacher has to say or what the teacher carries along in the classroom, perhaps uh, what he or she has, has, re has read or has learned, that she only transfers to you and that's it. So that's teacher-centered learning. 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis a student learning centered a student centered learning uh, picture here as you can see the arrows are actually um, pointing to each other okay so it could be a two-way process the teacher can actually bring along knowledge experience and beliefs which in return the learners may also share so interaction between the teacher and the learner happens okay so look at that it's even more of individual and collaborating students so it could be in a group that you can interact with the teacher or you can do it alone by yourself then there's that freedom okay you you get to share okay it's a two-way process the learning uh, process happens of course with active involvement coming from the learners okay so that's it that's how we we picture in simplest terms student-centered learning over teacher-centered learning and right now if you were to ask me what is it that we are supposed okay to 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 how do you call this to use in our classroom is definitely the student-centered learning okay because that is uh what the new environment or what the new curricular offerings are actually demanding and other than that of course you'll get to see as we go through what is it how is it advantageous to actually have student learning i mean student-centered learning at work all right so there are actually characteristics of a learner-centered classroom first is a personalized and customized learning so how do teachers have to go about this basically teachers have to respect individual differences so when we say individual differences the learners have uh, talents which others in the classroom might not have so the teacher has to respect this and uh, other than that if that is the case that the learners are actually varying with their uh, talents skills and abilities then the teacher also has to eventually consider that learning happens uh, self-paced meaning to say uh, learners work on their own pace they have their time not too early which may be too early for others or just on time for others or others may be late that is the reason why uh, in a personalized and customized learning characteristics we don't brand our learners as slow we don't brand them as fast but instead we have to understand that they are they are self-paced because of their individual differences all right so that is one of the characteristics of a learner-centered classroom what about social and emotional support what does a teacher bring in a uh, in a characterized uh, classroom like this which has social and emotional support so in here the teacher has this role of encouraging the learners okay to feel free to be who they are but of course with the responsibility of trying okay trying if in case they are hard up or if in case they are coping all right and uh, with that being said the teacher has this goal at the end of uh, uh, the curriculum maybe or at the end of the school year to leave that feeling to the child or to every child in the classroom that he or actually he or she actually belongs okay so the sense of belongingness is very important in here it is what the teacher is supposed to be cultivating among learners it is supposed to be what the teacher has to let everybody feel at the end of the day belongingness and that's very important okay you you get to be comfortable learning yeah right as learners you get to be very comfortable uh, learning or even be confident of uh, the, the things that you've got or the talents that you have once you are actually able to feel the sense of belongingness all right and third characteristic is self-regulation all right in here the teacher would uh, let the learners feel their responsibility over their own learning so meaning to say of course the teacher is there to to facilitate learning it doesn't mean that the teacher is already there absent huh? 
and then would just give the sole responsibility to the learners uh, to learn on their own. No, that's not what is meant in here. But instead, while the teachers teach or uh, do their approach in the classroom, they will find time, all right, to remind the learners that they have uh, the greatest responsibility or the greater responsibility rather on their learning. So how, how is that being realized among learners? Metacognition, all right? So the, the learners have to check on their own progress, have to check on how far they are learning because they are responsible if ever they, they slow down or if uh, they are missing out something. So that's self-regulation. You are given the responsibility, okay, to, to monitor your learning as much as you could, all right? And that's metacognition in itself. Uh, next is collaborative and authentic learning experiences. So in here, uh, the goal of the classroom is to let everybody in the class participate or uh, to, to be involved in dirty, but at the end of the day, full of learning experiences. You know, experimentations, uh, collaborations, brainstorming, or any other activities for that matter that would allow learners to create new information or even new knowledge. And the goal, as I have been saying a while ago, is to let everybody in the classroom develop higher order thinking skills. And what, for example, are higher order thinking skills? Your ability now to uh, problem solve, yeah, to solve problems. Your ability, of course, to think critically, all right? Because of uh, having been involved in situations or in some authentic uh, learning experiences, then you get to discover, okay, uh, some higher order thinking skills and you get to activate them while you do, while you do a task or even after you're done with the task already. And the last characteristic of a learner-centered classroom is assessment for learning. While, of course, uh, we, we also have activities in classroom which aim to evaluate learners in group, we have to remember that a learner-centered classroom has this bigger role of uh, individually tracking or monitoring the progress all right, of individuals in the classroom. So it's more of uh, looking into how one or, yeah, one, a name, okay? performs over Mario, but it, it doesn't have um, this intention of comparing, but of course of just monitoring how he differs from another in the classroom. So in, in that case, you are now actually guiding the learner to also progress, all right, uh, next time accordingly after you have done previous assessment in his or her performance. So that's it. These are the five characteristics of a learner-centered classroom. And uh, if you happen to be a teacher, all right, or yeah, you guys would be teachers in, uh, in, in a few years from now, then uh, you, you have to think about this. And um, you also have to know when when one has to work so that you get your learners involved in the classroom all right all right so here are psychological principles there are 14 and we'll see how each one differs from the other all right so there you have it, the first one, okay, of course, under cognitive and metacognitive factors. The first one is nature of the learning. So it says in here that the learning of complex subject matter is most effective when? When it is an internal process of constructing meaning from information and experience. So that's basically leading to the learner, all right? So how do you think about what you are encountering so how responsible are you of activating all right uh, the information 
Meaning to say, you have to be intrinsically motivated. There should be that inner drive that comes from you first in order for you to easily understand even complex subject matter. It's easy, of course, when you are driven, when you have that desire first, because no matter how much good your teacher is, how, how smart she or he is, if you are not receptive or if you are not willing to activate that inner drive in you to learn the information or to learn from an experience, then it still won't work. Okay, so it basically starts with you. There has to be that sense of desire to actually learn about the information or the experience. All right, number two, goals of the learning process. What does it tell? The successful learner, okay, look at this. How do we define a successful learner? Over time and with support and instructional guidance can create meaningful, coherent representations of knowledge. In here, we cannot detach, all right, um, a more knowledgeable other or the teacher for that matter to be there guiding, all right, or supporting, okay, the learner as he or she involves himself to a learning process. And it doesn't uh, start and end with just a very minimum, minimal rather, with, with just a very minimal time. But instead, the point here tells us that it's over time, okay? Meaning to say, it could be gradually until eventually the learner is now able to create meaningful and coherent representations of knowledge. Meaning to say, after there has been the guidance, the support, and um, uh, how do you call this, the facilitation coming from the teacher, the learner is now able to connect meanings and even create meanings and tell, ah, oh, this is because of the law of relativity. Ah, oh, this, this is because of the law of attraction. Things like that, stuff like that. You are now able to connect, all right, concepts with reality. And uh, the third is construction of knowledge, all right? What, again, is a successful learner? Okay, the successful learner ca can link new information with existing knowledge in meaningful ways all right so in here you can now already create all right uh, a piece of knowledge so let's say for example uh, you read about a novel or you read about an article and then later on your teachers would actually ask you to to write an essay maybe or a paragraph concerning a concept you are learning then you can actually pick out some ideas and then link or connect it with what you are presently doing and there are many ways in which we can actually link new information with existing knowledge and uh, products would tell us that uh, or i mean yeah tangible outputs can also happen in here all right so let's say for example you had your laboratory class and then but before laboratory class was lecture then after lecture, you are now asked to do a laboratory work. So how are you going to make a compound out of given elements? Stuff like that. So based on the lecture and out of your creation now during the, the process of executing, then you can actually create something. And that's construction of knowledge. All right. So we have the fourth one. That's strategic thinking. So the successful learner, again, we are focusing on what makes a successful learner and how a successful learner is actually described, okay? So that successful learner can create and use a repertoire of thinking and reasoning strategies to achieve complex learning goals. So here now is you are able to debate on something based, of course, on rationale, and uh, you are able also to defend all right uh, your stand because you have actually learned about concepts that would uh, validate or even support your claims this is strategic thinking okay and it's not only in debate but even when you are actually done with experimentations you can talk about it 
like you can you can tell how it's gonna work you can actually be proactive even and tell how it will benefit uh, humans or even uh, the purpose to which you have done it okay so that's strategic thinking you are now able to create and use okay you know because other than you being able to man on something you are now also able to link okay uh, reasoning to justify how is it that you were able to do it and what is it for all right so that's strategic thinking what about thinking about thinking all right i've been telling about metacognition a while ago and this is actually uh you yeah as it is said there you think about how you think how is that oh, think about that so higher order strategies for selecting and mo monitoring mental operations facilitate creative and critical thinking so uh, there will be times or there are activities particular activities uh, given by your teachers which really require you to activate your metacognition and you you will get to be surprised that uh, when you realize how you're actually about to do something already because teachers won't always tell you how it is done you have to discover all right later on you'll realize that as you are into the process or even when you're done with the process you are actually able to discover some more skills let's say for example you were able to discover that you can create that you can question and then after you can question you can provide answer and these are actually mental operations happening because of metacognition all right it can be a product of it but it can also be simultaneously a process with it okay next is context of learning learning is influenced by environmental factors including culture technology and instructional practices so what then do we have to remember if this is the case all right then this leads us to the fact that we have to uh, be sensitive all right with where the learners are coming or where are their clamors coming why is it that some learners are behaving like this why is it that learners could hardly cope with uh, technological use why is it that um, some strategies in teaching just don't work while others would work effectively so we, we have to look into these things so that as teachers when we involve ourselves already in the process then we we get to uh, pick uh, we have we have we get to have a wise pick or a wise choice of what might probably suit our learners and what might be effective for them without neglecting of course their cultural beliefs their cultural orientations and even their um, knowledge about technology that's context of learning you have to look into how it's gonna be when this is gonna be done for your learners of course all right next is motivational and emotional influences of learning so now here are motivational and affective factors all right so in here what and how much is learned is influenced by motivation all right so motivation to learn in turn is influenced by individuals emotional states beliefs interest and goals and habits of thinking so look at that um we we have to be realistic that uh, if you are not driven on something then you really don't have interest about it you won't mind you won't bother uh you won't even have uh, a time for it but once you guys all right have decided to actually learn about something then you will actually learn something and of course we can't blame others if uh, they, they don't do this themselves you know because it tells here that uh, there are varying emotional states and interests and even habits of thinking that people or learners have but um, we just have to remember that uh, 
if we of course want to learn much then we have first to have motivation okay it could be motivation coming from our parents from our dreams from our situation these are all factors that can push someone to actually uh, endeavor on something okay say for example why are you actually studying this who pushed you what brought you here or stuff like why do you want to succeed is it because you are very poor right now and you have that dire desire to to live that season of life and at least experience a, a wealthy life in the future stuff like that okay but there are of course many reasons why we enter into something and that's motivation and these could also be emotional influences why we learn okay why do you have to burn midnight candles for what reason okay next is intrinsic motivation to learn again intrinsic means it's a uh, self rooting it's coming from the inside of someone okay so the learners creativity your higher order thinking and natural curiosity all contribute to motivation to learn okay so sometimes if you get so interested about something and you kind of question how how is this done or how could this be possible H how how great that they were able to uh, orchestrate something like this so you know that sense of questioning that's coming from you will sometimes actually will most of the time not sometimes that's an understatement will most of the time actually move you to something isn't it you have experienced that for sure and many a times from all these questions forming in our minds we also get to discover new things no matter how difficult they may be we we, we discover that there is fun and that there is so much to learn after we have activated our questioning all right so that's more of the intrinsic motivation to learn next is effects of motivation on effort okay so how does motivation affect effort anyway okay so acquisition of complex knowledge and skills requires extended learner effort and guided practice without learners motivation to learn the willingness to exert effort is unlikely without coercion look at that it's just like telling again that uh, without you desiring first to learn then you will not really exert effort okay so that just means to say that uh, once you are motivated once you are willing okay once you are decisive about doing something about learning something you know you'll just realize that your effort would be normal and natural and uh, from there on you will realize that, it, that, it, that if it's normal and natural you can just easily acquire new skills and even knowledge and that's gonna make it easy for you try it just be motivated and effort just comes naturally okay so we have developmental and social factors this time so there it tells that developmental influences on learning so this uh, these two are now concerning developmental and social factors so what does it say in number 10 as individuals develop there are different opportunities and constraints for learning it's true um, once we grow and uh, if we may have observed during the different stages of our development there are things or stuff or yeah learnings that are easily accumulated while there are others that we could just hardly understand and there are also problems or even restrictions or constraints that makes it too difficult all right for us to understand things and of course there are also different opportunities wherein we, we we've got to involve ourselves and learn even better because development has you know unique uh, phases and uh, unique um, 
how do you call this, uh, encounters for each of us. And learning, of course, is most effective when differential development within and across physical, intellectual, emotional, and social domains is taken into account. So, what does this imply? Okay, this is imperative of uh, teachers being sensitive, okay, to what could be happening in the physical person of the learner or in the intellectual mind in the emotional status or even in the social domain or relationship so we we have to see like uh, what might be happening in the child what might he be thinking what could be the reason why uh, his intellect is like this why is it that he is feeling uh, uneasy in the classroom or why is it that uh, he seems to be lonely most of the time what could be uh, the problem in his social aspect like does he have a healthy family relationship does he have parents with him does he live alone stuff like this so we have to consider this in order to understand why some children or some learners don't seize opportunities the way others do and why is it that it's too difficult okay for many or for some learners to cope with challenges while it's easy for others so this is actually the demarcation line between learners performing, learners seizing opportunities, and learners being uh, very cool or easy at uh, managing uh, challenges in their learning. So we have to look into these accounts, okay? And the last under this is social influences on learning. So learning is influenced by social interactions interpersonal relations and communication with others so very importantly then we we have to remember that no man is an island and that we get to actually learn by interacting with people or by building strong interpersonal relations with others and by even conversing with others by simply talking to them about stuff about uh, books you have read maybe or about exercises you have discovered or about uh, new hacks that uh, you have uh, you have activated because of discoveries or because of doing new things these are actually social influences in learning and the people who would uh, give you an ear about this will eventually learn as well from you so it pays to communicate it pays to talk with other people all right so that's a social influence and in learning and here are the remaining three factors and they are under individual differences factors okay so the first one here is individual differences in learning so learners as it tells here have different strategies approaches and capabilities for learning that are a function of prior experience and heredity a very uh how do you call this it's well emphasized you know um if we tend to not understand our learners why they're behaving like that or why they're they're studying like that sometimes we have to also look back into what could be uh, that hereditary reason or how could it be with uh, their prior experiences why they are acting like this you know because whether we like it or not uh, these are factors why why okay why learners would be uh, showing their individual differences it matters to know that uh, there are factors from their genes or from their yeah heredity and even from uh, the sum of experiences that they have been involved with all right so next is learning and diversity learning is most effective when differences in learners linguistic cultural and social backgrounds are taken into account yeah right um, in learning and diversity again we have to be very specific and very um, considerate about uh, linguistic uh, cultural and social backgrounds you know, because if we are considerate of these stuff or of these uh, factors or of these areas, then we can actually consider what might work effective for a learner. 
and we also become sensitive already of the types of materials that we will be using or that we will be giving to them all right and the 14th or the last is standards and assessment in here setting appropriately high and challenging standards are and assessing the learners as well as learning progress including diagnostic process and outcome assessment are integral parts of the learning process all right so after all has been said in standards and assessment we we don't neglect of course um letting learners experience tough uh, complex or even challenging and highly standardized uh, type of assessments you know because whether we like it or not when when they finish their curriculum or even within the curriculum they will actually have to involve themselves with the uh, several types of assessment or uh, tests and um, letting them understand that uh, these are integral parts of uh, the learning process would make them accountable of their learning through and through not just after a semester not just after a grading period but even during the course of their learning because there are formative assessments that are given and these are standards and uh, you know uh, set assessment to uh, support or even to make learning uh, better and even lasting among learners okay so those are the 14 learner-centered psychological principles so don't forget that they are divided into four factors as i have mentioned a while ago and they are as accordingly here uh, summarized all right okay so i hope you guys have a good catch of that okay so meanwhile here is a research product a special issue of the american journal of education research in 2014 presents article summarizing these learner-centered principles which can actually produce encouraging results in the learning teaching process if all right if properly utilized and they are accordingly broken down into five areas the first one is the knowledge base what does the knowledge base tell us um you know this is a fact that uh, whatever we have already acquired as learnings or whatever whatever we already know would sometimes or would most of the time filter or even determine what more of learnings we wanted to acquire or it would filter what new information are we willing to accommodate or it would also uh, tell us it would also dictate us how relevant is the new information you are encountering so previous knowledge or background knowledge previous information or whatever you knew in the past or you have accumulated since then is actually becoming now a filter of what else are you gonna accommodate all right so that's the knowledge base next is strategic processing and executive control so in here again learners are asked to do self-regulation and to do metacognition you know uh, learners have uh, this responsibility already of uh, and control yeah the responsibility and control of uh, what uh, what do they do about what they have okay next is motivation and effect so this tells us that the learner-centered approach has actually led to higher achievement you know because uh, of intrinsic and uh, yeah intrinsic motivation and even the involvement of learners to the learning process they have become uh, more uh, how do you call this aware already and uh, they are doing it firsthand so the more that they are actually learning firsthand as well what they've got to receive and what they've got to uh, bring along so uh, research would tell that uh, the more they are motivated and the more they are involved 
in this approach of learner-centered, then the higher the achievement would yield. Okay? And the fourth one is development and individual differences. In here already, you would see that uh, the differences, all right, or the variations in developmental tasks, okay, would depend on factors. Why is it that uh, some learners would uh, do it easy, others would take it hard, or others would, uh, would even fail on something while others succeed? You know, because of the variation of task, all right, and individual differences. And we should not forget that there are factors behind these, okay? What could be? One is, of course, their abilities. We have to accept individual differences, that um, we vary in our ability okay another would be experiences how much in some have you been into experiences while others have been limited of it for reasons and of course environment how how healthy is the environment you're coming from or how failing is it so these are reasons okay for development and individual differences why do you develop fast why others aren't, all right? So, or why others don't rather. And the fifth one is situation or context, okay? So there are two very important things in here, okay? First one is the teacher's approach, and the second one is, of course, uh, student's engagement. Considering these two factors, you know, would uh, positively or negatively influence learning. So either way, okay? Sometimes, uh, the approach of learners would negatively, okay, I mean, of teachers, the approaches of teachers would sometimes negatively affect the learning of others, you know, because other teachers would tend to be so strict, other teachers would tend to be so autocratic, and uh, they don't listen to learners anymore. So what does that yield? Of course, it yields a very negative uh, motivation from learners, okay? Uh, generally, but others, of course, are motivated to, to prove, all right, their stand as learners. And, of course, it could also positively, um, how do you call this, affect learning if uh, learners get to be really engaged or involved, all the more. Okay, so these are the five, okay, areas as accordingly from the research. And that's it. I think that's the end of the document. And uh, as, just as a reminder, you guys have to not forget uh, commenting in below what you have learned for the day, as have you have been oriented about. And uh, that uh, please don't forget, I'm going to be giving feedback as well or some other information you have to consider in our group chat. Okay, so I hope you guys have learned so much today, just as I have learned as well. Thank you so much and goodbye. See you in the next unit.